we first met 14 years ago, John, you talked to me about your disillusionment with the Western humanist tradition culminating in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. You were, you were pleased to have discovered a submerged medieval tradition of mystical thought that offered you a, a new resource. You were so disenchanted, I remember, with the, the carapace of culture that you, you sought to step outside it into nature to, to de-civilize yourself, uh, as it yeah, were, but yeah. th- that didn't quite solve the problem. You see, I came back from Canada. I, I mean, I came from the bogs, and I became a glutton for culture. Like, I, I ravened through libraries because I was hungry, not because I, I needed, wanted to become an encyclopedia. I was hungry f- to name myself, to speak myself to myself. And there were myths and symbols and legends and stories that were doing that for me. So I went through libraries seeking, seeking vocabulary, basically, and... So after years, I was glutted with culture, and I was seeing everything through the eyes of an Anad or through the eyes of a Raphael, through the eyes of a Phidias or through the eyes of Shakespeare. And I quit. I left in Canada, you know, to, uh, teaching the history of European ideas, basically, and I came back to the bogs of Connemara. And there was one day when I was lying out there in the bogs of Connemara, and... Uh, I was lying at the edge of a lake and there was a grey crow above me and there was a lap, 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 lap of water blowing onto the rock that I was lying on. And it kind of disturbed me, the grey crow above me thinking of me as carrion and the lap, lap, lap of the water. And I was thinking of me and my education. I got up and I walked across the bogs and a hair broke away from me. And instantly I collapsed down onto the bog and I eased my head down into the hair's forum in the heather and the, the warmth of the hair was still in it and the smell of the hair was in it. And I asked that hair's form to heal my European head, to suck all my education out of it, to suck European culture out of my head, because the European head was no longer good for the earth and wasn't good for me. And I wanted it to be a kind of poultice that would suck it all out. And I remember on the way home, I decided I must baptise myself out of Christianity and out of culture. And I actually immersed my head three times in a little stream that was flowing down into Loch Father. And I came back a second time ten days later, and I immersed myself three times in a stream again. And that day was a fine day, and I was going home, and I called into the shop looking for a few groceries, and one of the girls said, the lot save us. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're like a drowned rat. <laughs> I mean, is it, has it been wet out there? And I couldn't tell her what I'd been up to. So I was literally baptizing myself out of culture and out of Christianity. In the meantime, I didn't go back to do the third, the third session of ba- to complete the baptism. Um, my bluff was called. And I see what I was needing, Andy. I was wanting to recreate my mind again from pure sensations, from the color red, from to build up like a build up a mosaic uh, with individual tesserae. The individual tesserae would be the individual sensations, like sensations of hearing, touch, taste, smell, to build up my mind all over again. A new mind is what I wanted. But the new mind would be founded not on concepts, not on myths, not on stories. It would be founded on sensations, on things I saw and things I heard. And that's what I wanted, and I passionately wanted, because living in the splendors of Connemara, I mean, uh, you know, that, that I thought was enough. But then, living at a frontier for a long time, I needed... I found one day, my bluff was called, as I was telling you, and I needed help from cultural wisdom. And I was back into culture again. Mm-hmm. But this time, I was looking, for, looking at the mystics. This time, it wasn't the culture that I was teaching in Canada anymore. It was um, the Rhineland mystics and the Spanish mystics. They were the people who were talking to me now. I find that you, your writing is deceptive in the sense that we, the reader, enjoy the fruits of your labour without a lot of pain. I mean, it seems to me that a lot of the work you've done is is hidden. Well, yeah, I suppose you can't, like, the poetry of ab reaction, for instance, you can't put it all... I mean, it is reflection. I mean, when Wordsworth talked about the poetry, like, it is... Uh, you remember in tranquility. You have to get to the place of tranquility. I mean, there's the turmoil, there's the tumult, um, there is the upheaval that you go through. And then, while you're in that, you really aren't writing about it in a way that's communicating. Mm. You have to wait for a point where there is a place of calm, 
there's firm, solid ground again. And then you can look back on it, and it is in reflection that you acquire the experience all over again, that you acquire it for the first time. First you live the experience, then you appropriate it, but you appropriate it through myth and through symbol and through concept. And writing is the act of appropriation. Writing is the act, appropriation in tranquility. Now you can walk around the whole experience and you can see it and evaluate it. But while you're in it, um, it is turmoil because you, you can't predict where it's going, you can't see the shape of it yet, um, and it's only after you come through it, it's only after you come through puberty that you see the shape of it after all. Mm. And if you, have, if you have what you call spiritual upheavals in your life, it is only after you've come through them that you can see the shape of it and see that there was maybe a providence in it all. I take it the first reactions you got to, to um, what you were writing about that, that, uh, that kind of voyage was, was crucial. I mean, what, did you get a sympathetic response from people? I was, I was wonderfully lucky. I was put in touch with people who could speak to me, and I ended up in a Carmelite monastery in Oxford, and... Um, I was picked up at a station and I was told, I'm, I, here in Morehampton Road, I met a man that I went to see, and he said, the man you need to meet is in Oxford. He has been through the fire. And one day I was picked up in the station in Oxford, and I was driven to a house, to a Carmelite house, by a West Cork man. And he had a lovely West Cork accent, so that was lovely. And I crossed the threshold into this Carmelite friary, and three steps down the corridor, his voice dropped, and he said, there at supper, very quietly, he said there at supper. And I said to myself, and I knew, I'm home. This is home. I felt I was fished out of the sea because when my world collapsed, crashed in against Darwin's world, when Bishop Usher's Psalms, which was 4004 BC, crashed. You see, I grew up in that world where the world was a play in five acts. There was creation, fall, Revelation, redemption, and last things. Now, that was a lovely, tidy play written by God, scripted by God. And I lived in that world, and I knew the traffic rules of that world. Then that world crashed in against Darwin's world. The Bishop Usher's sums crashed in against Darwin's sums of 600 million, 700 million. So I fell out of my world. I w fell out of my story. I was man overboard. And when you're man overboard, you're in trouble. And I was man overboard for years. Then I walk back into the Christianity, the Christianity that I thought could no longer speak to me, and here I am now walking back into Christianity. And but I'm walking back into a, a mystical order, a Carmelite order, and I cross the threshold and I say, I'm home. I'm fished out of the sea. And tonight I was at home. And I spent eleven days with the Carmelites. And the Carmelite day that I lived with them was beautiful. The Carmelite day has wisdom in it. The Carmelite day is as beautiful as the Arda Chalice. The Carmelite day, its rhythm of contemplation and silence and talk, and the rhythm of that day, the shelter that I found in that Carmelite monastery was a wonder to me and still is a wonder to me. I mean, Shat Cathedral is beautiful. The Carmelite day is just as beautiful. Would it have appealed to you? Did you think about it as a possible yeah. way of life? Yeah, it and... and my longing is to be a Carmelite, but I couldn't be... A, I went back and I lived with them for a year, and then I went, lived with them for four months, but as a layman. And, um, and again for four months, and they allowed me to stay because I worked in the garden for them. So that was the quid, quid pro quo there. And the Carmelite day nourished me and sheltered me. I mean, what do we need? Houses don't shelter us. But the Carmelite order did shelter me 